Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. The science is not settled. We have a wonderful guest today, Lawrence Solomon, a world-renowned environmentalist, author, and activist who's been at the forefront of movements to stop nuclear power expansion and to save the world's rain for us. He's a colonist with National Post and the author of many books. But the most recent, one of the best sellers on Amazon is called The Deniers, the world-renowned scientist who stood up against global warming, hysteria, political persecution, and fraud, and those who are too fearful to do so. He is also the executive director of Energy Probe. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lawrence Solomon to its rainmaking time. Good day, sir. Good day. Fighting for the environment is not new to you, and it would at first appear to environmental activists that you're against saving the planet. But yet, when I read your book, I connected to being called a denier, because in my first show of its rainmaking time covering climate and weather, I was called a denier for daring to ask the difficult questions and to look at different aspects of the scenario. Talk to us about why the science is not settled, having talked to all these world-renowned experts. Well, it's not settled because there's simply no uh, unanimity. Uh, if, you, if you canvass the views of top uh, experts around the world, you realize that there's a uh, dispute about whether the um, uh, Arctic ice is uh, is melting in any unusual way, or if it's been if it's really business as usual. There's dispute about uh, Antarctic uh, melting. There's dispute about uh, the oceans rising. There's dispute about uh, glaciers uh, melting. Um, there's dispute about whether uh, the planet is even warming. There's this dispute about the validity of the models. Um, there's a dispute, in fact, in, in, in virtually every area uh, that the uh, global warming doomsayers uh, claim is beyond dispute. Apparently, in your book, you talk about very specific rules you followed when putting the book together, trying not to settle the science yourself, which I think was very smart, and not to play the numbers game. Talk about what that means, that you didn't want to play the numbers game when you went to do your research? Well, science isn't really about whether um, there's a, a consensus uh, at all. Science really should be about um, the validity. In fact, great, great scientists have, have tended to be um, on, on the outsides of, uh, of conventional thinking. Uh, they're the ones who, who, who said that the, the sun... Uh, does not revolve around uh, the Earth. It's the Earth that revolves around the Sun. So those who break from scientific dogma um, have been the path breakers, and, and in time they've been recognized as such. So the tradition in science is not to, not to take a vote to see who's right. The tradition in science is to pursue uh, scientific truth. And um, so for that reason, the, the very notion of there being a, a consensus uh, doesn't sit well with, with scientists, and I don't think it sits well with, with most members of the public uh, who think about it. At the same time, uh, the typical layman um, can't assess the science uh, for himself, um, has to rely on, uh, on uh, the authority, on the credibility of, of people um, that, um, uh, that, that uh, he's presented with. So there is this... Um, uh, there is this conflict about about what to do. Ultimately, we have to to go with people we trust, and and especially when public policy uh, is at stake, it, it's necessary to have a, a, a vigorous public debate. In the context of consensus, for just a moment, how do we arrive at a consistent frame of reference for what we're studying or talking about? If consensus shouldn't be built into science, I mean, I totally get what you're saying, but then. How do we even agree on anything, and should we? Well, in most areas, I don't think we need to agree. In most, in most areas uh, for, of science, for example, some scientists can pursue uh, paths that, that they think will be profitable. Um, others 
uh, other paths that, that where they think that uh, they'll, they'll be able to, to, to get uh, valid results. And there'll be a competition among different uh, competing theories in science. And over time, the, um, that'll be sorted out and we'll have a, an idea of, of where the truth lies. Do you think it could be said that the more we need to have a consensus in science, that it's almost like a barometer. The more we have to have a consensus and that's forced, the less likely true discovery can happen and be made manifest and available. I think that's an important um, insight. There, in, in most spheres of, of life, we don't expect everyone to agree to, to be on the same bandwagon. Uh, in science, we haven't expected that uh, in the past. But when we do expect it, when we do try to enforce a dogma uh, on science, uh, we, we do end up with untoward uh, results, and, and those results um, it can be seen in the in the, uh, in the in the regular economy as well as the, the the market of ideas. On page 19 of your book, there was this question: What happened? to the peer review process, and I was so excited when I saw this because we're doing a show on peer review in two weeks. It said peer review does not fully vet the papers before they're published. Let me repeat that. Peer review does not fully vet the papers before they're published. And therefore, because peer review is seminal to, integral to, central to discovery or alternate views and hypothesis coming out into the world, then we have to look at peer review. And I just wondered if there's something that you can say about that. I thought that was an extremely important part of your book. Well, the, the, peer, the normal peer review process um, was suspended uh, in the case of uh, the global warming um, uh, theories and it was suspended by the um, the IPCC. Uh, normally, when uh, in science, the uh, the peer reviewers um, are uh, are unknown to the to the authors of the study. That way, the peer reviewers are 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 free to make an independent uh, uh, comments. Um, under the the process that the UN set up the authors know who the peer reviewers are. So many peer reviewers would be reluctant to, to, to make a, a criticism uh, of their colleagues. That's, that's one way in which um, uh, legitimate dissent was, was squelched. Uh, another aspect to peer review is that when an author receives um, criticisms, he's expected to uh, respond to them. Um, and to give answers for why he's uh, accepting or rejecting them. In the process that the UN set up, uh, that wasn't the case. The, the, the authors could really act on their own to decide what they would um, accept or reject. They, they didn't have to answer um, criticism. So in effect, the United Nations process uh, turned the peer review uh, process um, on its head. The extent to which it did that it was actually greater than I realized when I, uh, when I initially wrote my book. Only, only um, recently with the, the climate gate emails that came out did it become clear that often there was no, uh, not only no peer review, but not even any, any real science uh, behind a lot of the claims. Often the claims were based on, on inadvertent comments that, that people might have made or or on uh, um, material that might have come from a popular uh, magazine, as was the case um, where the IPCC used as a, a source of mountain climbing magazines, and mountain climbers might comment on whether there's more, more or less snow that now than there was in the past. And that would suddenly be, make it into the uh, IPCC uh, report um, as if it had the weight of science when it was really the views of a few, a few hikers who were remembering things from the past. How has your book been received beyond being an Amazon bestseller? Well, it's been received um, uh, extremely well. One thing that my uh, f foundation uh, was, was uh, surprised by was the absence of uh, criticism from, uh, from our supporters. 
were were a, a were a federally uh, were a, were a federal charity in, in Canada. Um, we get support from 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 individuals. Uh, we we're one of the longest standing um, environmental organizations uh, in Canada, and we expected that we would come in for a, a fair amount of criticism. Um, but that really wasn't the case. The um, the the public. Um, has has really at least sorry the our supporters our traditional supporters um, who have been concerned in the past about our the, the various issues that we've uh, championed such as conservation and renewable energy um, alternate uh, types of energy um, they they um, with rare exceptions perhaps just three or four um, uh, critics. Um, have um, have warmly received the the views that we presented. Let's talk about the case of the disappearing hockey stick that Dr. Edmund Wedgman is that his last name? O- o- Wegman. Wegman discussed. Talk about that because the hockey stick has been known as the poster child for the IPCC, as symbolic evidence for man-made global warming. Share that a little bit. Well, the hockey stick graph, uh, as you say, was was a poster child for the a child for the global warming movement. It 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 um, the long handle of the hockey stick represents uh, the last uh, most of the last thousand years during which temperatures were said to be fairly stable, and then in the last hundred years temperatures shot up, and that's the blade of the of the hockey stick, and that's why. The, the hockey stick uh, graph uh, got its name. So that that graph is the single biggest reason that the public became swayed to the idea that the Earth is warming dangerously. The, the graph showed uh, almost a thousand years of steady temperatures, and all of a sudden, in in, in recent times, temperatures shooting up. Well, that graph, which um, which the the UN um, presented with great fanfare, and the pub and the press picked up with great fanfare, um, uh, became challenged, and uh, among the the critics, uh, the chief critics actually were um, a couple of um, of Canadians. One was uh, a Canadian uh, a statistician who who worked with the uh, the, the mining industry. His name is Steve McIntyre, and he he was actually a frustrated uh, mathematician. He 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 graduated uh, from University of Toronto many years ago. Uh, had intended to take up an academic career. Uh, found himself working for a mining company, and in, in effect, never never quit the mining um, the mining area. So his career was spent in mining. But when he saw the hockey stick graph, he said. I recognize that graph. That's the graph that mining promoters use whenever they're touting a, a new claim. So he became suspicious of it, started looking into it, um, asked the authors of the graph for their data, uh, found that they weren't forthcoming, uh, started digging more and more, and, 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 and came up with reasons to think that the graph might be uh, bogus. Along the way, he uh, teamed up uh, with uh, uh, another academic, and um, uh, and together they 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 published started publishing studies um, discrediting the, um, the the hockey stick graph. Well, uh, this controversy ended up getting going to. Uh, the the U.S. Congress and hearings were held, and the, the Congress decided to get a referee to see well who um, who is right. Uh, is it is it these two Canadians, or is it the UN uh, scientists? And the um, the person that the uh, congressional committee got to 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 act as referee was Edward Wegman, who was one of the uh, top statisticians. Um, in in the U.S., he's, he's the former chairman of the 
Committee of Applied and Theoretical Statist Statistics of the National Academies of Sciences. So he put together um, a blue chip panel to investigate uh, the claims and, um, and then presented it to, to, uh, to Congress. And he was actually shocked by what he found, uh, and not just because he found that the, the UN's claims were bogus. Um, he, he, he was shocked because the, the UN scientists who produced the hockey stick graph had no background in uh, advanced statistics, which was the, the discipline required to actually produce their study. And he was further shocked to see that the, the peer reviewers of the hockey stick study didn't have any, um, any uh, uh, real knowledge of uh, statistics. So with no one having any knowledge uh, in the field, it's no wonder that the, that, that graph would be, uh, would, would be invalid. Essentially what they discovered was that the hockey stick graph, the model that produced the hockey stick graph, would always produce a hockey stick shape regardless of the data that you, you put into it. You could, you could put baseball data into the uh, hockey stick model uh, into that graph and uh, into that model, and you would get uh, a hockey stick shape. Absolutely frightening. And yet, this graph has been seen all over the world for how many years? Oh, it's, it's, it's going on two decades now. Let's talk about Roger Revell, Gore's mentor, his professor, and the influence he had on Al Gore, and what we need to know that's relevant about Roger Revell toward the end of his life. Well, Revell was a a legendary scientist uh, in the field. He, he inspired um, Al Gore. Uh, Al Gore has often referred to him as, as his mentor. Um, but, it, but it turns out that uh, Ravel didn't, uh, didn't agree that global warming was necessarily catastrophic. He thought it should be studied. He thought there was, uh, there was a lot that, that, that needed to be pursued. But while Al Gore was warning the world of the great dangers, Ravel was, was writing letters to legislators saying, well, wait a minute, don't, you know, um, look before you leap. There's, there, there's no reason to, to assume that, that any kind of cat catastrophe is around the corner. At the end of his life, wasn't he declared senile, or people said he was senile? Well, it, it did become nasty because... Um, uh, Al Gore, uh, to rescue his own reputation, um, did uh, uh, did promote the view that that Ravel had become uh, senile, and that became a uh, that became an, an unpleasant uh, episode. In the field of science, is it possible to leave your post if you've been wrong about something? Is there any wiggle room for Al Gore to be able to stand up and say, I was wrong. I'm an environmental advocate. I want to make the world better, but I've done some things that were wrong. Do you think that's possible? I don't expect to hear that from uh, Al Gore. I think it takes an unusual person to admit wrongs of the, of the scale that, uh, that his have been. The way that I evaluate whether there's shenanigans going on in an industry or in an arena is the quicker they close the case, the faster they squelch dissent, the harder the propaganda is, and the more hysterical the matter is to talk about, the more politicized it gets, the more trouble there is in the deep levels of it. And therefore... I really would like to talk about Antarctica with you, both the Arctic and Antarctica. We have seen so many snapshots and movies and videos of ice sheets melting and polar bears standing on a little bit of ice and ready to fall in the water and no place to go. You spent quite a bit of time laying it out, but I was wondering if you could brief us. I understand that there's 14 million square kilometers of Antarctica. So when we speak of Antarctica, the part that is losing ice is in the northern peninsula. Can you talk about that? Because 
what we see are only little glimpses of whatever we get on videos or television or something on YouTube. Well, Antarctica is an immense uh, continent, and it's also um, an inaccessible uh, continent. There's very, there's there's very um, a little of it that has been um, explored. There's very little of it that that uh, provides us with 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 measurements. Um, we can know a little bit about the fringes, but there's only one way to know what is happening over the expanse um, of Antarctica, and that is with satellite measurements. So satellite measurements started to be taken uh, a few decades ago to, to see if um, Antarctica is uh, uh, thickening uh, or if it's melting, thinning. Well, the, the, what the satellite data shows is that parts of Antarctica are thickening, parts are thick, thinning. Um, all Overall, Antarctica is thickening. So it's accumulating ice. It's not melting. It's not leading to, to a, a rising of the oceans. In fact, just the opposite to, to the extent, extent that it's thickening it's drawing water from uh from the oceans so by the only measurement that really has any kind of of validity large scale validity antarctica is not at all melting it's true that in some parts there's there's calving that's going on uh, ice is um is falling uh into the ocean large amounts of ice but this is part of a natural process that's always happened uh, parts uh, of Antarctica expand, other parts uh, recede. These days, and, uh, it has been um, um, expanding. Why are we hearing that the ice caps are melting? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's not because of the data. Okay. And what about Greenland? Well, Greenland has, has also been experiencing the, the great variations that we've seen. You know, Greenland was uh, once entirely um, covered in, in ice. Then, around a thousand years ago, there was a, a great warming period. It was called the, medi the medieval warm period. During that period, uh, the Earth was probably warmer than it is today. That was a period of great uh, flowering. It was a, a period when... when uh, Prosperity increased, lifespans uh, increased enormously, um, agriculture improved. Um, this is throughout, throughout Europe and also, also in Greenland. It, it was at that time that uh, the Vikings settled Greenland. Agricultural colonies uh, were set up there. Um, it became a, a, a place that became very uh, habitable. So, the notion that um, the variations that we're experiencing now are, are uh, anything outside human experience just, just doesn't um, correspond with, with uh, the historical records. We're going to move to the subject of the deniers itself. Anybody who's a denier is associated with what? The term comes from uh, Holocaust deniers, from people who, who denied that the, um, the, the Nazi Holocaust um, uh, occurred. And it's a way of discrediting um, people who disagree with, with the global warming orthodoxy, to, to discrediting them as, as uh, loons of some kind in the same way that, that uh, people who, who don't believe that the, the Nazi Holocaust occurred. In my experience, just covering this subject and I've done about maybe 12 this will be the 13th show on different aspects like spokes of a wheel there is tremendous dogma in this arena tremendous when you move outside of the pure data and scientific synthesis of things it's hugely dogmatic almost religious I'm a person who believed in it as reality never rolled up my sleeves to look inside the different aspects of it, was convinced 
and really sold from seeing an inconvenient truth and reading the book. Sold. Unchecked. I didn't verify. I just believed. And when I had the wake-up call was when I began to do an inquiry on this show, and I cover a lot of subjects on this show, I was shocked at the level of propaganda and how science has become, or maybe it's always been, we just didn't know it, how heavily politicized it is. And I'm so sad about science. And I'm wondering, do you think there's hope for science? And if so, on a funding level, what do you see for science if the popular view is this translation of what's happening on planet Earth, how are scientists going to be empowered to do their work and stay free and clear of political, I'm going to say, interference? Well, this, this, this probably is a low point um, for, for science. I think there has always been um, manipulation of science and uh, uh, pressure and peer pressure. So a lot of what we, we see in in the global warming science, I think on a smaller scale, has um, uh, existed in the past. Uh, it, it does seem to, to me, though, to be off the charts now, the, the extent to which science has been uh, politicized. But the answer to me is, is to remove the politicization. There's, there's far too much funding um, going into uh, the global warming science. The U.S. alone has provided something like $80 billion over the last uh, 20 years to uh, global warming science. The fact that it, it has, there is so much money in, available in this area means that other areas of inquiry, of scientific inquiry, have been starved uh, for funds. Uh, we, need to, we need to scale this back um, uh, dramatically. And if we do that, um, and also if we develop mechanisms to have funding come less from government and more from, uh, from uh, arm's length institutions, um, I think we will be much better off. Why do you think it is that people that are not endorsing whatever the official story is about what's happening with climate are being forced to go along? Why do you think it is that more people don't stand up knowing that they won't be funded, but standing up to support truth and science? Do you think it's because that individuals lack internal faith that the funding may come from somewhere else? Well, I think that there are a variety of reasons. One is is that um, uh, scientists aren't aren't all scrappy. A lot of scientists just they're nerds. They want to do their their work. They they don't really care about uh, politics. They just want to be left alone. Uh, they might be interested in in a particular pursuit, and um, often what they're able to do is to rewrite their funding proposal to give it a global warming slant and then they'll get some funding for it and they'll be able to do their work and uh, get the results that they want. Um, uh, if, they, if the results aren't politically correct, they can write their conclusions in a way that hides the fact that it's not politically correct. So we get a lot of, a lot of science that actually disputes the conventional uh, wisdom, um, but it's written in such a way that it's just not clear. The, the, the information is fudged. So I think a lot of it just deals with the disposition of, of scientists. People often go into science because uh, it's, um, uh, it's an area they, they love, and, it, and it's got nothing to do with, with public policy. It's got nothing to do with um, um, uh, 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 politics. It's, 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 it's simply a, a private uh, concern. In other cases, scientists are... Um, are fearful of losing funding, so they they they, um, they will compromise um, their beliefs. Um, scientists have families to support, and uh, they're they're susceptible to the same kinds of pressure that that people elsewhere are. Something else that I think has happened uh, to science is that it has become um, a job. A lot of people in the past people went into science because because of a passion for science. Uh, that's that's no longer the case. A lot of people are 
choose science. Um, they might consider a, a career in science uh, or a career as a uh, in a in 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 marketing. And they might have a, an ability to do either, and they'll just choose the one that seems to be um, better, better paying, or uh, or that might give them other perks that they're they're interested in. But the the passion for science might not be the the big driver the way it would have been, say, 50 years ago. So I think there are a lot of a lot of reasons that um, uh, that scientists behave the way they do. Do you think it's possible, and you're in my lifetime, for science to be funded? outside of governments well not likely but but i think that would be wonderful if it were um the case it uh i think it would it would uh, end up with a, a democratization um of science and um we would have then uh more competition in the world of ideas and i think we would have more robust results see i think we need a nasa type paradigm and i don't mean nasa the organization but a nasa like occasion in business that is not run by governments and not answerable to governments that needs to be set up to make sure that science is and will be free and clear to do its job one mechanism um, by which uh, science can be made independent is to uh, is to allow um, uh, individual taxpayers to direct uh, the research funds to uh, any area that they that they choose. So, if there were uh, 300 million uh, choosers of of an area for science, rather than uh, ultimately a, a few government controlled um, funding organizations, I th- I think we'd see uh, a lot of very interesting results. I don't think we're that far from it. I think it's a question of a few people getting together and deciding that. That's how it's going to be. <laughs> Think about that. A lot has been done when two people agree. <laughs> Let's talk about CO2. This is one of the most frightening parts of the entire debate. I grew up thinking that CO2 was a pollutant. I was taught that for years and years and years. Of course, I would never know that it wasn't, that it was food for plants and all of human life and animals and nature. But apparently, it doesn't stay in the atmosphere for 50, 100, and 200 years. Talk about it. Well, there are lots of different, um, uh, different estimates of, of the qualities of, um, of CO2. This is another area where, uh, where the science um, is, is not settled. But, but what you said about CO2 being, um, uh, being nature's fertilizer is, is uh, something that people really need to um, uh, uh, understand until not that long ago CO2 was universally seen as beneficial and it's really it's really since the the UN became potent and the UN's um, intergovernmental panel on climate change started producing its reports that the view of CO2 um, started to change my organization has uh, has been opposed to um, uh, un, uh, d- d- dirty fuels for a long time. So, for example, we have been uh, opposed to coal because of the many pollutants inside coal. Coal has uh, NOx and SOx and uh, uh, mercury. Um, these are these are problems that need to be targeted. And in fact, society has targeted them, and and we've had very good results. Um, from the targeting, coal has become incredibly uh, clean over the uh, over the decades. It's it's nothing like what it was um, a generation ago. Clean coal now is is something that I think is is desirable. But what we've started to do is is to also target CO2, which is um, which which is a uh, a component. Um, the carbon is a component of of coal, which is actually beneficial. It's nature's fertilizer it helps plants grow the until a few um decades ago we didn't um we didn't have a good handle on whether the planet was becoming um uh greener or not and then with satellite technology we started measuring the amount of biota uh, on earth and 
what the satellite data here shows is that the planet has become steadily greener over the last 20 years. And one reason for that is the extra CO2 that's been put into the atmosphere. It has promoted plant growth. Another reason for the planet becoming greener has been the, the warmth um, that we've seen for much of the, of, uh, the last uh, half century. And the warmth also uh, promotes plant growth. It, it allows the tree line to, to go um, further north. Um, it's beneficial for, uh, for greenery. We exhale CO2, don't we? Yes, we do. And in effect, we're in a carbon biosphere. In your book, it talked about how the ocean has 50 times more CO2 than the atmosphere. So why is the EPA demonizing carbon? Well, this is, uh, this is the, perhaps the only tool that the um, uh, administ- U.S. administration has to uh, control um, CO2. It, uh, I, I, I believe that a cap-and-trade bill uh, can no longer pass because the science has now uh, gone overwhelmingly um, to, uh, to establishing that there, there is no credible risk of uh, a catastrophe that comes of, of CO2. So there isn't going to be legislation, so the, um, the U.S. administration, which wants to do something about um, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, will have to use the EPA to do it, and that's, that's the only tool it, it likely will have, so that's the only tool it's going to be using. Can we trust the EPA today? This, this is a, such a politicized area that um, I would say no. I, I certainly would not trust it. Professor Tom Siegelstad talked about CO2, and he talked about how the models related to CO2, that there's a missing three gigatons of carbon not explained by the model. Can you explain this? It, it's actually a, 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 quite a, a convoluted um, explanation. But basically, the, the, models, the models can't account for a, a huge amount of, of CO2, and there are various theories about where it could possibly uh, be. And Siegelstad has the answer. He says it's not missing. It's simply in the ocean. The, there's always been a, a balance between the, 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 the CO2 in the ocean and the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, it's been regulated naturally since since time immemorial and um, and that explains it dr sammy solansky i looked up on wikipedia he was one of the people that you interviewed at the max planck institute for solar systems research in germany can you say something about him and then i want to talk to you about what i found on wikipedia well he's actually um um interesting um in, in several ways he um uh, when I interviewed scientists, many of them were, uh, at, at least especially at the beginning of my uh, of, of writing my my newspaper columns, which ultimately became my uh, my book. Many scientists were um, reluctant to be interviewed uh, initially, and many uh, refused uh, uh, actually refused to to be interviewed. Others others didn't want me to even use their 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 published information um, in my book and um, that ought to tell you something right there why a climate of fear like this there shouldn't be there should be excitement to share and synthesize and cross-pollinate information and findings correct there should be but they also know that um, that their funding depends on uh, on having the right results and the right interpretation from their uh, data, the acceptable interpretation from uh, their data. Uh, e- even in cases, in some cases, scientists are willing to to risk the scorn uh, of others, but um, but they find that their their colleagues in their university departments uh, aren't uh, 
uh, aren't happy with that because they they fear that the entire university could lose its its funding. The entire university department could lose its funding, not just uh, the scientist that decides to uh, to go rogue. So there are um, there are a lot of pressures on on scientists. Uh, in I I can't. Uh, in some cases, the scientists have told me what uh, what what their reasons are, and others and others, of course, they won't tell me. But um, but that's something that that I did that I that I I have remarked that a lot of scientists do not just do not want to be uh, public. Dr. Solanke from Germany said something was written in Wikipedia regarding your interview with him that he was misquoted. Do you agree with that, or is that just somebody going on Wikipedia writing whatever they want to write to discount your interview with him? Well, it's interesting because. Um, so Solanke uh, told me that, and he said, "Where, where have I ever said this?" And I gave him about six six citations for where he had said it, and he, well, he, I think he was quiet after that. I don't know if he didn't realize how often he had made certain assertions, um, or. Uh, or if there was some kind of a bravado, but um, it's indisputable that he made the claims he made. Um, he just he just wasn't happy with them being put in um, uh, being repeated by by me uh, because it it didn't it didn't serve the interests of uh, uh, of his institute. Then I would probably respond to that section on Wikipedia. I used to think Wikipedia was a great thing, and now with everybody being able to go in, well, not now, that's how it started. Everybody can go in and change everything, so you can smear, discredit, lie, distort, and people will think that what they're reading, because it's Wikipedia, is all facts, and it's not. When I read this, this little piece, that he was misquoted, I thought, how could someone do an interview with somebody or put somebody in a book that goes all over the world, particularly on something this serious? And misquote him. It didn't make sense to me. So I'm glad you addressed it. Dr. Shaviv from Israel. Talk a little bit about him. Well, he co-authored um, a, a, a study that uh, that concluded that most of the global warming um, comes from uh, from natural causes. It comes from from the uh, cosmic rays. Um, he came under heavy um, criticism, as did his, uh, uh, his, his co-author. What is going to happen now with regard to your book being out? Are you doing speaking engagements, traveling to talk about this book? What is the next step for you? Well, the, a, a paperback edition of, um, of The Deniers is, is just coming out now. It, it, it might be out this week, for all I know. Um, and uh, and yes, I, I I do do some traveling, and I do um, talk to uh, members of the press, such as uh, such as you, who are interested. And um, from from my perspective, the um, the debate is uh, is nearing its end. The majority of the public in in, in most of the Western countries now uh, have radically changed their their views. They're very skeptical of of the notion that. Global warming represents um, anything dangerous. Um, I think we should be able to wrap this up uh, fairly soon. Talk about your work with Energy Probe. What are you doing with nuclear power? If you wouldn't mind just sharing a few minutes about that. Well, we're we're critics of um, of nuclear power. We've been critics of nuclear power since the uh, 1970s, mainly on um, economic grounds. Uh, nuclear power has never been uh, economic anywhere in the world. Uh, no nuclear reactor has been uh, built without uh, government uh, backstops. Um, there's, no, there's no reason really for this technology to be, um, to be promoted, but it's being promoted out of a kind of ideological commitment that so many people have to uh, nuclear power. Um, it's actually a very, um, a very inflexible uh, technology. I view it as a, as an immature technology. Nuclear power has to run twenty four seven. It's in the nature of the of the technology. Otherwise, uh, 
uh, otherwise it, its operations can be dangerous. But so because it has to run 24 um, seven, it, um, it, it doesn't have the flexibility that other forms of generating electricity have. So it, could, it will be, because it, it'll, it's running flat out all the time, a plant will pr- provide uh, more than enough energy um, to, to meet needs at, at, say, 3 o'clock in the morning when people are asleep, and too little energy when people uh, need it at, say, 6, o- six o'clock in the evening. You can't, you can't ramp up uh, nuclear reactors to, to give you extra power when you need it. You can't ramp it down when society goes to, uh, goes, goes to sleep. So the result is that, that the few jurisdictions that have tried to rely on nuclear power have gotten into trouble. The, the best example of this is uh, France, which um, generates uh, close to 80% of its electricity from nuclear power. What happens is, um, during most of the day, it's producing much m- more than it needs. So it has to export uh, its surplus to neighboring countries. But because power at 3 o'clock doesn't have much value, it exports its electricity at a loss to its neighbors. It's lucky it has neighbors that are larger than it who can absorb the surplus electricity, but it's exporting that electricity at a loss. Meanwhile, uh, at, at peak periods, it, it's short of electricity because it can't ramp up its nuclear plants. So at peak periods, when electricity is very expensive, it has to import electricity from its neighbors. So France brings in a lot of electricity, most of it from, um, from Germany. And that is ruinously expensive. So it's importing electricity at high cost. It's exporting it at low cost. It's losing a lot of money uh, in the process. It became so disastrous for, the, uh, f- uh, for France that, that the, the head of the French power utility, Electricité de France, called called the financial system uh, situation catastrophic. Um, France is now bringing back its old uh, oil fire generating stations that, that were built in the 1960s to meet its, its peak requirements because it, it found it just couldn't go on uh, with, uh, on this nuclear path. What do you think we should be doing for transportation? My... My preferred remedy is to start tolling uh, all the roads, to, to toll roads based on, on the demand for those roads. So the, the tolling should, should be higher at peak periods and lower at off-peak periods, and that way the, the road system would, uh, would, would be used much more uh, intelligently. I think we would eliminate all tra- traffic jams uh, if we had proper pricing uh, systems in place. It's, the, the system is called... Uh, congestion pricing. A few, a few European uh, cities have started it, um, and, um, and and Europe plans to go to the to the system. The it has proven to be um, very popular. You might think that tolling would be unpopular, but um, but in practice it became popular. A good example is what happened in uh, in Stockholm. Before the the tolling experiment started, the the public uh, was against it. The the you know, the polling that took place showed that the public didn't want it. But a six month trial period was in, put in place, and um, the public was given a chance to try it out. And then they were uh, a referendum was held after it. Well, as soon as the the trial period started. Uh, t- Stockholm residents saw that their travel times uh, decreased. Uh, life became easier for them. Um, they uh, the, 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 they found it wasn't difficult to rearrange their um, their schedules to avoid the the the, the, the peak uh, pricing. Um, then the experiment ended after six months. Uh, the day after it ended the traffic congestion came back uh, and people started grumbling about the fact that they they no longer had their system. The referendum took place and it passed. 
the majority of Stockholm residents decided they would rather pay for the service that they get and get a good service rather than have have a free service that l- led to frustration. Um, London was the first city to try uh, a, a tolling system. Uh, the the uh, it became the the issue on which uh, a mayoralty candidate campaigned. He said, "Elect me mayor, and I will bring in this tolling system." To everyone's surprise, he he uh, he was elected. The tolling system was brought in, and it was uh, popular. He then ran for re-election um, on that uh, on that scheme. It ended up becoming unpopular in London because it was uh, it became used for all kinds of politically correct measures, including global warming. So all kinds of taxes were heaped on. But when the tolling was used um, in a, a, a way that was simply meant as an economic instrument to, to um, charge more at peak periods, to charge less at off-peak periods. I listened to you very carefully, and I could see how that could work. But doesn't that then translate as penalizing the people that have nine-to-five jobs because they're getting to work early in the morning. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, and I've been on a mission for 25 years, so I don't have to deal with what 95% or 99% of the people have to deal with every day, having to be on the road and at a place at 8 or 9. And therefore, the peak hours of traffic congestion are for the average person who has to be at a work location by 8 or 9, right? and then has an hour for lunch between 12 and 1 or 1 and 2, and then is going to go home sometime between 5 and 7. Most employers are not going to shift their minds about that. So how do you see that supporting the average person? When, when, when people decide where they're going to work uh, and where they're going to live, they usually take their transportation costs into account. Right. Often people decide, um, I'm... I can get a, a bigger house further out. It means I have to travel an extra half hour or an extra hour, but it's worth it to me. So people make that kind of, of calculation. They're always trading off distance, size of house, um, with, uh, with convenience and cost. And usually when they figure out the cost of living further out, they, they, they will look at, say, their gasoline costs and maybe the wear and tear on their car, um, but they'll, they'll trade that off against saving a... Uh, a lot of money, perhaps, on on the capital purchase of their house. Well, if if there was a a more realistic um, calculation that occurred, if they had to account not only for their for the cost of using um, uh, their car and their gasoline, but the cost of the road, which right now people don't see directly. Often, they don't pay at all for the roads that they use. Um, if they had to pay for the cost of their roads, they would start making a different calculation. And what we would see is people would start living um, closer uh, to their work or closer to their uh, school, and their travel times would come down, and therefore their their commuting costs um, would go down. So we would see um, people's living patterns change naturally as they responded to the, the pricing signals. Maybe I'm not sure. I can see it on a conceptual level, but in the practicality, there are so many people I know that live an hour or an hour and a half that drive in to, let's say, Burbank or Los Angeles to do their day job, and they'll do that, but if they had to live close to where they were working, they would pay double the rent they're paying now. And I think when you get down to the brass tacks of that translation... I'm not sure it would equate exactly the way that you're saying, but I think it's an interesting prospect to consider tolls. I just don't know how the people that have traditional day jobs wouldn't be penalized in the process. In the past, cities were uh, residential areas. We still have in our cities uh, very nice residential areas, but most of them have, have been degraded uh, over time. They, they were really degraded since, since the, the 1930s. Uh, the depression prevented uh, reinvestment in nice areas, and then the then the wartime economy made it difficult. And then uh, public attitudes uh, changed largely because the, because road systems were were subsidized, and the interstates came in, and public public dollars 
transformed the traditional lifestyle that Americans had. I think we, by withdrawing <clears throat> the, the, the subsidized road systems that were brought in place mostly after World War II, we would revert to the kinds of living patterns that historically we had, which were um, <clears throat> living much closer to home, shorter uh, travel distances, I think there would be more urban communities, fewer uh, suburban communities. Uh, the communities would, would tend to be uh, denser, um, more compact, more services within uh, communities. So I think living patterns would change, but they would change not to something terribly unfamiliar. They would change to, to what, um, what they were like, say, in the 1920s. Would you be interested in building a new eco-city or developing some ecosystem and an eco-city somewhere around the world? No, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a utopian that way. <laughs> what do you do at Urban Renaissance? It's a division of uh, the same foundation of Energy Probe uh, Research Foundation, and it, it's concerned with, um, <clears throat> with precisely the, the kind of... Um, of the issue I just described with, with road tolling, with, uh, <clears throat> with the living patterns that, uh, that people have. What we have done um, over the last <clears throat> few decades is heavily subsidized um, rural development and suburban development and uh, at the expense of urban development. And the effect of it has been to decrease densities in cities so they are less city-like and to increase densities uh, on the outskirts so that they're less rural. And the effect of that is to create a kind of a mush where, we, <clears throat> where we've lost our wilderness areas, we've lost our rural areas, um, and, um, and we've also lost our urban areas. So I'd like to see um, a restoration of the balance and I don't want to impose that balance. I, my, my utopia is simply letting people do what they naturally would do if they weren't being pushed and prodded this way or that by government incentives of one kind or another. Do you have any concern about the radiation from microwave radiation stations or the level of radiation that's coming in from outer space and how that may affect climate? Well, that has always affected uh, climate. Uh, a lot of the solar scientists <clears throat> um, have theories about how radiation affects climate, but this isn't something we're about to change. You know, the, the sun is going to keep keep uh, shining for a few billion more years, and um, I, I don't see any any way of dealing with uh, with that. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us as we end this discussion? One. One point that people often um, don't appreciate is that um, our, our attempts to uh, comply with Kyoto not only have economic costs, they have environmental costs. And that Kyoto has become the single biggest destroyer of the global environment. My, my environmental group works with um, citizens groups in the third world works with them at, at the grassroots level and many of them are, are up in arms over what Kyoto has done to them. When we try to cut back on carbon emissions here, often through mechanisms such as carbon credits, uh, you know, we might purchase a carbon offset. Well, the, the, the other half of that transaction is the purchase of a, of a carbon sink, uh, typically somewhere in the, in the third world, typically it's something like a eucalyptus plantation. Eucalyptus is a fast-growing tree. Uh, it's very good at taking carbon out of the air. Well, to get the land to plant that eucalyptus plantation, uh, farmers are often driven off their land in the, in, in the third world, and then the carbon credits are used to finance uh, a eucalyptus plantation. Or an old-growth forest might be taken down and replaced with a, with a eucalyptus plantation. Uh, carbon credits are also financing hydro dams uh, throughout the, the third world. You know, many, many hundreds of, of hydro dams. And hydro dams stopped being economic many decades ago. All the good hydro sites were, were taken up, say, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And the ones that remain aren't economic to develop. Well, now with 
carbon credits from the West, those hydro dams are being developed. And when you build a hydro dam, you're often taking out a, a river valley. Uh, often that's the most um, arable land um, uh, in the country. So we're losing uh, arable farmland. We're losing species because these uneconomic uh, dams are being built. We're often relocating a lot of people. So they're losing their livelihoods because we're building these economic dams. So Kyoto has devastating environmental consequences. Uh, it's it's not just a, a, an economic calculus that we have to look at. Wasn't a major hydro dam put in China that displaced a few million people? That's right. The Three Gorges Dam, the, uh, the, the, the biggest dam ever, uh, ever built. And, in fact, the Three Gorges Dam has been opposing it, has been a, a lot of the work of, uh, of my foundation's Probe International Division. It's, it, it's, it's been the, the, the chief organization opposing this dam uh, since 1990. What happened to all those people? Well, they were driven off their land. They were, um, they were typically promised uh, compensation. They were, they were told they would have a cash settlement and, and equal land elsewhere. Um, often when they turned up, uh, showed up at the government department to collect their compensation for their land, they were told, oh, I see you've already taken your, you've already received your compensation. So what, what happened was corrupt officials would sign in for them, take their money. So uh, as a result, there's been all kinds of riots when people were denied their compensation. They, out of desperation, they, um, they, they, many have resorted to, uh, uh, to violence. Um, others that didn't, when they went to the new lands, they found that instead of the, uh, instead of the, the, the lowlands that they were used to, say, and fertile land by the river, they were given land high up that wasn't arable. And, and it's not surprising that, that, the, that the land which wasn't settled wouldn't be desirable land. That's why it hasn't been settled. But that's what the government would give them as compensation. So it created um, enormous upset, and, and several million people were, um, were moved. Uh, cities were inundated. Uh, species uh, uh, were affected. Um, archaeological treasures were inundated. Uh, uh, enormous cost, the cost to navigation as well. Um, to finance the Hydro Dam, the Three Gorges Dam, a national tax was imposed um, on electricity users throughout China because although the dam was um, promised to come in at a, at a low cost, it, it was expensive in the end, and so expensive that no one wanted to buy power from uh, the Three Gorges Dam. They, they wanted to buy power from, from, from other uh, electricity sources. So the government um, uh, forbade that, forced everyone to take power from the dam and to finance the dam. They imposed this, uh, this tax on users across the country, regardless of whether they were, they were actually using power from the dam. Lawrence, are you familiar with the energy source called Helium-3? No, I'm not. It's the source of energy that Harrison Schmidt wrote his book, Return to the Moon, about that's very prevalent, this energy source called Helium-3. He's very interested in making sure we have available here. That's supposed to be phenomenal. I'll find out on Thursday. <laughs> Want to go to the moon for this next electric opportunity? Well, I don't view there, there being any energy crisis. I think, I think there is uh, um, e enormous amounts of, of fuel of all varieties. The only, the only question is, is the cost of the energy, whether financial cost or environmental cost, and that will vary from region to region. But I don't see there being any, any energy shortage uh, of, of any kind materializing in, in centuries. Do you have any concern about our grid, both in Canada and the United States? Well, the grid isn't, um, uh, isn't as reliable as it should be. The, the, the U.K. grid became very reliable after, uh, after it was privatized in, um, in 1989, 1990. Uh, before then, it had been uh, derelict, lots of, lots of outages. After privatization... There was a, a very good regulatory regime was, was brought in into the U.K. 
where the, the, the private grid company would have to pay if it inconveniences customers by, um, by having uh, power outages. And it, the grid became very good at avoiding uh, discomforting its customers. It, it's, it's, it's the way, it's a, it's a very good model for all of us. What is this big explosion about Bloom Energy? What is it? It just came out. It was on Google. I guess Google's on the board or Google's part of this new Bloom Energy. What is it? Well, there's a lot of hype about it. It's, 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 it's a, the latest um, uh, incarnation of the fuel cell, which is a, a gizmo. It's a, it's a battery-like gizmo that can be fueled by natural gas. The, the Bloom cell would be fueled by natural gas. And um, uh, the idea is that you don't need to have a, a grid, an, an electricity grid. You can just have one of these little fuel cells, which are, say, the size of a, of a small fridge for a house or a large, a large fridge or several fridges for, for a company. And um, you, can, you can dispense with, the, with, with power lines coming into your house. You would, you would instead run your fuel cell off natural gas. Or in some areas, you might run it off a, a off a different biogas. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's I think it's uh, mostly hype, uh, but but ultimately there are there are lots of competing fuel cells out there. I think they all have their place. The, the problem with the fuel with the the bloom box, uh, as well as the problem with energy technologies generally, is that the the, the government plays such a a large role in picking you know, winners and losers that it it distorts um, d- distorts the the um, e- economy for uh, all these energy technologies. So the the fuel cell the the bloom box is getting government subsidies, and it the idea behind it is that it could eliminate the electricity grid. Meanwhile, governments are pouring billions of dollars into uh, next generation electricity grids. So the two, the two are unlikely to uh, coexist, at least as presently uh, imagined. So there's, there's um, uh, a, a disconnect caused by competing government policies. And um, in my view, the, the only way to sensibly sort it all out is for government to abandon the energy business entirely and let the, the bloom energy and all the other technologies um, find find their own place in the energy marketplace. Do you think that you and I are going to be alive to be forced to use carbon measuring devices and to have them in our homes and cars? No, I think all that's going to disappear pretty soon. I think the whole, the whole carbon dioxide scare will, um, will be disappearing. Fabulous. That's fabulous. Because that's really scary. Because that means you have to have carbon measuring devices in the ocean... You have to have carbon measuring devices on every living thing if you really want to calculate it all, <laughs> don't you? Yeah, well, it's not it, it, it's not a, a realistic. Uh, it, it's it's another one of these utopian schemes. <laughs> I don't think it will go anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking to, listening to, learning from Lauren Solomon, the author of The Deniers, the world-renowned scientist who stood up against global warming hysteria, political persecution, and fraud, and those who are too fearful to do so, and the executive director of Energy Probe. Lawrence, thank you so much for your time today, and we hope that you'll join us again. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure.